I watched the movie Gandhi, I remember um, one time there was a reporter walking with Gandhi, you know, when he was in South Africa and he was building ashrams and everything, and, and the reporter from America said, Mr. Gandhi, you are quite an ambitious fellow, seeing the ashrams being built around and everything. Mm -hmm. And Gandhi smiled with his sweet gentle eyes, turned to him and just looked at him and said, I hope not. And I was like watching the movie. I mean, every time I'd ever heard mm -hmm. the, the whole discussion of ambition before in the world, when somebody had talked about ambition, the response to, you're quite an ambitious fellow, has yeah. been, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I started to, I, something resonated though when I heard Gandhi say, I hope mm -hmm. not. There was something inside of me that kind of leaped up for joy, like, whew, that's a different response. And, and what I've seen more and more as I've gotten into the Course is that, as Tara Singh says, uh, of course, um, <coughs> that whenever we're ambitious in a worldly sense, then we also have a sense of, of ruthlessness that comes in with that ambition because as soon as I'm striving to gain something of the world, then I will then I will perceive my brother at times as obstruction getting in the way of my ambition, of what I want. And so all of a sudden Gandhi's little statement, I hope not, took on new meaning because it was like, oh, but ambition is such a, a deeply, I mean, I like you up in America, the, the land of the free and the free enterprise and everything, and, and I really had a very positive um, connotation and association with ambition. And it's only been going into the course deeper and deeper where Jesus will throw out a line like, um, perhaps you have noticed an outstanding characteristic of, of the ego, that every end, the ego end that you have pursued when you have achieved it, has not satisfied you. That is why the ego is forced to constantly shift from one goal to the next, hoping that you will find something that will yet satisfy you. When I read a quote like that from Jesus in the Course of Miracles, it was like, oh my gosh, this is what I've been doing my whole life. You know, I did it in, in college with degrees. You know, this degree is not enough. I need this degree. I've done it with relationships. This relationship is good, but I can do better. This, um, I've done it with possession. You know, this car is nice. It has all these extra silk steering wheel and rear window defogger and everything, but I'm really not satisfied. I've kind of got my eye on that car over there, you know, and, and it's like after a while, it's slowly starting to see. Yeah. And it's like, it seems to be never ending. So I think, I mean, in, in one sense, we're just trying to expose the ego thought system. Um, we talked a little bit about this last night, too, is like, the, it, it can seem a lot of times in reading the Course where people can feel like, wait a minute, this seems like a sense of relinquishment. Now, I've, I've learned all these things, and I've kind of got accustomed to a certain life style, and, and the Course is coming along, and it's kind of saying, your perception's all messed up, and... Um, Occasionally we'll use words like Jesus will say, give up the world, you know, and he even puts an exclamation point behind it one time, so you know he must be, <laughs> he must be pretty serious with his idea. But through the ego's lens, it's kind of like, ooh, I don't want to give up anything. Right, and I feel like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, it's like I'm accustomed to this, and thank you very much, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I enjoy this. And it's kind of like what I sense Jesus is he's so eager to see, to help us see that, that by pursuing and seeking outside ourselves, so to speak, instead of within where the kingdom is, that it's really a painful pursuit. You know, at times it's kind of like, I, I want you, Jesus, I want you to take all the pain and grief and misery out of my life, and I want to keep things just the way they are. You, and you can see where, in a sense, it's like asking, asking to put together, to reconcile truth and illusion, mm -hmm. in a sense, of seeking outside my, I want to seek out myself and I want to be peaceful. And the more I've studied the Course and kind of gone into these things, it's like, well, I really need to embrace the inner, I need to embrace that light within my mind, and I need to start to, to let go of these goals and pursuits and everything. If only because 
when I have goals and pursuits in the world, then I have expectations of how I think the script needs to go to fulfill my goal. In other words, if I have you know, real ambitions as far as being the best tennis player in the world or the, the wealthiest man or the, the, uh, the best of something, or um, most maybe... Most appreciated most course of miracle teacher. Oh, yes, a, a, a <laughs> very well-renowned, appreciated course of miracle teacher. It doesn't so much matter what the form of the, of the ambition is, but, but if I have a form in mind, then I, I will have expectations on how I want it to go. I may, if I'm really looking to be a well-renowned course of miracle teacher, then I may start um, having expectations of how many people you know, are in the audience, <laughs> or, or how much, how many books I sell, or how many tapes I sell. You, you can see where you start to, you're, you're setting yourself up for the pain because you're having expectations of how you want the script to go. That is how it's been taught. My gosh, that's so ingrained. That outcome. It's good to have outcomes in mind. And the only way you can have good outcomes is to have those goals set in place from the beginning. You know, it's like. That's what it has to be. There's that insidious thing that um, says um, if I accomplish this goal, then I'm better. Mm -hmm. uh, and not only better than other people, but I'm better than I was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's a lie. Yeah. <laughs> but in and of themselves, they really aren't bad. Yeah, yeah, and we have to get real clear of what that in and of themselves means, or if it has any meaning. Is there any is in there and any of itself? Meaning? In, a, in other words, we were thinking of maybe going to Lesson 184, which kind of gives the sense that that everything that we've come here to learn about, we've, we've come, we've, we've learned about separation and fragmentation. Mm -hmm. Think of it as if when you're a little kid and, the, and your mom or dad comes along and says, can you say ball? Can you say, you know, slide? Can you say grass? Can you say tree? Or this is a pencil. You know, that that the learning of the world, or what if we look at lesson 184, it gets a sense that the first phase of everyone who comes to this world is learning how to label and categorize all of the separate objects. And of course, it's taught that this is very important because if you don't do this, then you won't be able to make it in the world. This is mature, you know, mature education. And if we look, maybe we'll take 184 to, to see that, yes, that's the first phase of our learning in the world, but to really be released and to really come to peace of mind, we have to enter into another phase in which we start to let go of the meaning and the purpose that we've given to everything. So it's the attachment to what they mean. The attachment to what they mean. That, that we're convinced we know what they mean in and of themselves. And, and actually, what Jesus is teaching us is that we have read a lot of false meaning into everything. And we really need to have a complete transformation where we open our minds up and say, okay, maybe I don't know how this should go. <laughs> maybe I'm just going to take your hand and walk into this and trust. And, but it's, we need to start somewhere at, at this unlearning process. There's another thing about our learning, too. As, as children, uh, we, we almost always do this. If, uh, if we're the teacher of the child in identification, we'll say, good, good, mm -hmm. and this is this so-called encouragement. And there, you're, we're building that that feeling that this makes me better since I, in the little child, even, to feel you know, So we get these neurotic kids when they get into school. They, they felt that they were all right until we come along and told them they were good and better. Yeah, and if I learn some more, I'll even be better. And, if, and you know, the other kids aren't learning as much as I am, and I'm getting A's, that makes me better and better and better. Yeah. And the boxes, even though they're supposed to give us security, like this, is, these are categories and boxes that maybe mom and dad teach us that are rights and wrongs and do's and don'ts. Then when we go to school and we meet the other little kids, we start to say, wait, wait a minute, something's going on funny because their boxes seem to be a little different than my boxes. Mm -hmm. Jimmy's mom and dad don't don't think that that's good at all. Mm -hmm. My mom thinks it's good, and they, you know, there's a all of a sudden there's an in insecurity because now the boxes start breaking down. And then when we go to adolescence and when we go to college, I meet people from all other regions of the country sometimes or the world. Boy, the boxes. Then it starts to be a topsy turvy thing like. 
who am I? What do I really believe about anything? You know, it starts to really get turned up. And, and I think that's what's so great about the course, is he's saying, yes, this whole process of making boxes and categorizing is, is judgment. And that we need to, you know, just like it said in the Bible, judge not. Boy, <laughs> you get to the Court of Miracles, he makes it real clear about all of our pain comes from our own judging and categorizing and splitting and breaking apart. And the good news is, of course, that the Holy Spirit has a, a different judgment that's in our minds. Totally, we can tap into this within our minds if we let go of, of our judging, kind of get out of the way. So that's, you know, that's good news. Maybe we can just go around and, and everybody can read like a paragraph. That's Lesson 184. Yeah, Lesson 184. I'll do the first one. Lesson 184. The name of God is my inheritance. You live by symbols. You have made up names for everything you see. Each one becomes a separate entity, identified by its own name. By this, you carve it out of unity. By this, you designate its special attributes and set it off from other things by emphasizing space surrounding it. This space you lay between all things to which you give a different name. All happenings in terms of place and time, all bodies which are greeted by a name. That's what we were talking about. I was just thinking about any kind of specialization or expertise in anything. It's just like taking this kind of to the nth degree. You know, where I know everything there is to know about whatever. You know, I know all the names for all this, but you know, it's like the mind wanting to just break it apart, break it apart, break it apart, and then feel like it has a handle on each one of these little parts. I'm an expert in this. I'm an expert in this field. Like a, in the old days, a general practitioner doctor had to learn about all the parts of the body, how the body, the nervous system, and the endocrine system, and the respiratory system function together, and and also maybe some psychological things when their when their patients seem to be resistant to certain things, you know, just how to get along with people and so on and so forth. And then if you look at the trends in medicine, for just for example, what Beverly's saying is like now the days of the general practitioner are kind of it's like radiologists. You know, and Oncology. ear, nose, and throat Oncology. doctors, and podiatrists, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. This is, once again, it seems like the ways of the world. It seems like that's the, that's the way that this thing seems to be going. That in order to survive, the ego would teach you've got to specialize. And I was sharing with them last night that that's been that was the conflict that I felt in my mind when I was ten years of college was that this little voice in my mind kept saying, "Step back, pick further." see the big picture. And the other voices in my mind, which is coming sometimes even through uh, my mind and parents and professors, was kind of like, you are not going to make it unless you settle down and pick an area of specialty and focus your attention and become specialized. And so for the longest time, it was like a push-pull kind of a thing in my mind. And the deeper I, I've gone, though, I questioned every field I was in. I questioned the assumptions of it. I just, I, I couldn't just, like, pull off and just say, all right, I, I'm going to quit questioning the, the meaning of life. <laughs> I'm just going to be, be a good psychologist or be a good educator or be a good urban planner and so on and so forth. That I kept going deeper and deeper and, you know, coincidence, and finally I, I have a book like this that that says, in order to learn this course, you have to question every value that you hold. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, that's what this little voice has been telling me all along, but, you know, <laughs> am I nuts or not? And the book keeps saying, you know, you have sanity within you if you keep listening to the little voice and, and not listening to this other voice.